Welcome to episode 5 of the Mile 62 podcast. I'm your host, Richard Elkins, coming to you from Austin, Texas. We cover all things ultra running in the southern United States. I have a great podcast for you tonight. Uh, quite a few subjects I'd like to go over, um, including recovery, daily news, salt tablet discussion, snake discussion, how to handle snakes, and a preview of the J&J 100K, and finish up with a product review on the Garmin Phoenix 6X watch. I'm going to compare it to the 5X. Let's get started. I'd like to talk about recovery. Um, I listened to a real good podcast recently. Um, there was a, a master dietitian. Her name is Annie Weiss. She was on the East Coast Trail podcast. And uh, the information was real good. I've been listening to recovery advice for many years. Never really heard anything that really I could really uh, relate to. But she really put it near, uh, summarized it very well. And I'd like to uh, go over it now. Um, she recommends that after a hard workout or race that you should use a 1 to 4 ratio. What does 1 to 4 ratio mean? That's one part uh, protein, four parts carbohydrate. So <clears throat> if we break that down, if you are to, were to eat 25 grams of protein, let's say in a smoothie, then you need to have 100 grams of carbohydrates at the same time. Um, this is very important because this rebuilds your glyco glycogen storage in your body. If you don't do this within 30 minutes to an hour after the workout, the body will continue to uh, basically eat your, eat your muscle tissue. Another way to handle this is you can, you can buy a bottle of chocolate milk. I thought it was very interesting. She said a, chocolate milk, uh, a bottle of chocolate milk is exactly a 1 to 4 ratio. So if you don't have a capability of eating a good meal or a smoothie handy, you can use a bottle of chocolate milk um, after the workout, and that, that'll do the job. Another thing important to <clears throat> uh, keep in mind is the body can really can't process more than 25 grams of protein in uh, one, one sitting. So it, doesn't, it does no good to eat 40 or 50 grams of protein at one time and, and consider that all you need for the day. It's better to break up the meals, break up the protein usage. I also, <clears throat> I've been using Hammer Recoverite for a while. I'm not sponsored by Hammer. I've tried many different products, and I think that's a very good one as well. I mix it with milk, and it uh, tastes very good. Uh, it is kind of expensive, but I think it's convenient, and I use that after workouts. And uh, when, when I have a chance, I also use smoothies. The next thing I'd like to talk about is um, salt tablets. <clears throat> This is something I've been studying for a while because um, last year, let me back up, I've been using hammer salt tablets and to be honest, um, over the last year I've stopped using them. I think they don't work very well and I've also come to the conclusion that I was taking too, mu too much salt tablets. I heard on a lot of podcasts and read that you need a lot of salt, you need a lot of salt, be careful, you need a lot of salt. Well, um, I've, I've also heard of uh, the, well, dietitians talking about it and also uh, like Hayden Hawks um, came out and um, discussed his problems with salt tablets. He found out that he was taking too much salt. Last year in uh, Havelina, I made it through the four laps, uh, about 82 miles, and then I had some problems with my lower back. And um, after lots of thoughts over the la uh, last year, I really... Uh, two things that my core wasn't strong enough but I also think I took too much salt tablets during the day and I really um, by the 20 hour mark was really out of balance and it, it eventually ended up uh, I had to DNF the race I just after rest I didn't have enough time to finish the race <clears throat> so 
listening to uh, dietitian uh, Annie Weiss, she she touched on this subject too, and said that you really don't need more than a, a f one or two tablets during a a hundred um, k, for example. That's if you're drinking a lot of sports drinks and you're eating food from the aid stations with contained salt. That doesn't mean you know showing up and eating a few potato chips or uh, one potato or something like that. You need to eat quite a bit, as much as you can, you know, in that 300 uh, calorie range per hour. And you should be okay on salt. I'd like to hear your opinions on this. Uh, please feel free to send me an email. I've, I've heard both ways, and there seems to be a, a, a subject that's debated a lot. But I've come to the conclusion that I, I was taking in too much salt. And I'm going to try that strategy tomorrow. I have 100K tomorrow. And um, the dietitian that gave the advice, uh, Annie Weiss is a very accomplished ultra runner. So um, I think she knows what she's talking about. And I've read um, discussions from Hayden Hawks and other coaches that, that really warn do not take too much salt in. You know, you can, if you don't take enough, if you don't have enough salt, you can have problems. If you take too much in, you, have, you can have problems. So you need to have some kind of balance. <clears throat> Daily news, ultra news, um, over the last week, um, some interesting uh, items I read and uh, listened to on some podcasts. The CBD discussion came up again. Um, I listened to on one podcast an interview with uh, Lauren Gross. She's the triathlete that um, got uh, disqualified for six months because she had THC in her system during a race. Well, the interesting thing is I, I I don't know much about the rules of triathlon, but um she she explained that you're you're allowed to have THC in your system from the the creams or other products uh, out of the race, but not in the race, and she had been using a lot of uh, of a particular CBD cream uh, for several weeks before this race to alleviate pain, but she did not realize until. Her lawyer tested the CBD cream that the THC level was too high. And um, I, I, my opinion is, after listening to this, I, I, I feel for her. I know she makes her money from triathlon, but I guess also being from Texas, I, I take a more conservative approach. I really don't like that these products are on the market. You know, CBD, you know, THC, is, it's a derivative derived from marijuana. I, I really think that um, athletes should not use them. And... Uh, just kind of going back to what I said in my last podcast, you got to be careful of what you put on your body and put in your body, you know, you know, whether or not you're taking uh, salt tablets or putting creams on your body um, or taking special types of vitamins. You may not know what the source is and uh, they're not very, they're not, most of them are not regulated by the FDA. So you got to be careful. Another, th another um, discussion that caught my attention during the last week was a famous uh, obstacle course racing uh, female athlete, uh, very popular name. I'm also a fan, uh, listened to one interview with her and she came out <clears throat> discussing her issues uh, with uh, eating disorder and uh, she made the comment that, you know, maybe she's old and washed up at, and I thought that really struck a nerve with me. I don't like when athletes come out and say that they're too old to participate in sports. Um, granted, I've never been an elite athlete, and I don't do it for money. It's just a hobby. But when someone in their you know mid thirties, she's thirty seven years old, comes out and and debates whether or not brings up the subject that she may be old and washed up, I think that's ridiculous. Because you know you look at uh, UTMB, the top three females were all in the same same age. Uh, Courtney DeWalter is 36 years old. And uh, um, many of you may have heard of Tour de, Tour de Jantz. I'm probably butchering the name. It's an Italian race. It's actually one of the longest ultras in the world. It's uh, 330 kilometers or 205 miles. And it's got like 31,000 meters of ascent and, de and uh, descent. It, it's just a... a uh, really really tough ultra and it takes several days to complete and it it it, it winds through the Italian mountains <clears throat> well this year um uh, it was won by a 50 year old man 
and um, in that race were several top name pros and coaches from the U.S. And uh, so it just tells you that uh, age really, age is really just a number. You know, I I don't like people using that ex excuse. Anyways, I, I just thought I'd bring that up. Um, I'm a little bit biased because I'm in my early 50s myself, and, you know, I consider myself in better shape than I was when I was in my 30s. But I think age is a number, and uh, for my listeners out there, I hope you consider it the same. Don't, you know, impossible is just an opinion. You know, get out there and get it done. Um, another thing I like to talk about is uh, snakes. Uh, why, how to handle snakes, uh, you know, this is the time of year when there's a lot of snakes out, and uh, you're not going to hear about it much on other podcasts, and the reason is because most of the elite athletes, uh, uh, most of the time, they don't run at night. They So fast, they finish right as night nightfall happens. <clears throat> most snakes uh, are nocturnal. They tend to come out at night, or uh, you're more, more likely to encounter them during the, the evening, you can encounter them during the day, but usually it's usually e easier to avoid them during the day. Um, but the reason I this, I uh, was thinking about snakes, I was watching uh, a um, documentary on National Geographic of the 70 most dangerous animals in Latin America with my children. And uh, they went through a cougar and crocodile and everything and then come to find out one of the most dangerous animals in Latin America is actually a small snake called the fur de lance pit viper it kills so many people every year and and uh, so it really had me thinking about snakes uh, the fact that it was more dangerous than a uh, cougar that can you know crush your skull and you know swim in the river and take out crocodiles and stuff which just I thought was really amazing but its venom is so strong that if you don't have help immediately, you can die. But it had me thinking about snakes and my encounters with snakes uh, over the years. Um, I really have come to peace with snakes. Uh, when I first started trail running, I was kind of terrified of rattlesnakes. I actually started trail running in California. And California, Colorado, I think you're, uh, you're more likely to encounter rattlesnakes and uh, other dangerous snakes. And the reason is, is because those are... Those are state and uh, federal parks, and also the, I think the culture of those areas, they like to protect the snakes, whereas in Texas and in the south, it's mainly landowners uh, where the trails are, and uh, landowners don't like them. They, they, they usually kill them. So the population is not, not nothing like in Texas like it is in uh, Colorado or California or up northeast, but we do see them. Um, there are a lot of snakes in this area, <clears throat> and you got to be prepared. Um, let's, let, for example, let's talk about the rattlesnake. Um, there are a lot of uh, discussion out there and uh, rumors, true, false. You know, can a rattlesnake uh, 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 strike you um, when it's not coiled up? And I, I first like to say there's a difference between strike and bite. What is strike? Strike is when the snake actually uh, slings itself at you and tries to bite you. So the answer to that question is yes, a, a, a snake uh, can bite you from any position. So let's say a rattlesnake is uh, stretched across a trail or across a road. If you get close enough to it, it can bite you. It can turn its head and bite you, but it can't strike you. In order to strike you, it needs to pull back or in most, in most situations, it needs to be in a coil. Another thing to keep in uh, mind when you're dealing with rattlesnakes, it doesn't have to rattle its rattle in order to strike you. That's another myth out there. I've had several encounters with rattlesnakes, and I can think of uh, um, several where I come up on the rattlesnake, it crosses the trail and, make, and goes on its ways. It is true what people say, you know, snakes really don't want anything to do with us. And if they can get away they will and that that really goes for all types of snakes um i had an instance um a few months ago at possum kingdom um it was a 69 mile uh trail run in central texas it was very hot and uh 
I ran the <clears throat> the entire race, and about two miles from the the finish line, I was going down what looked like kind of like a fire road. It was just a gravel road, and it was dark, <clears throat> very dark. <clears throat> and um, most of the time at night when I'm running, I use two lights. I use an ultra, ultra Aspire waist light, and I use a black diamond headlight. So I can see very well. I kind of look like a freight train going through the woods. Well, I was running down the road. Keep in mind, I've already run 67 miles. And uh, I'd been out there about 15 hours, 16 hours. It was a really long race. And uh, I looked up in the grass uh, on, on the right side of the road. And it looked like, uh, it was beautiful actually. It looked like kind of an Excalibur sword with diamonds all over it. And it was just laid out in the grass. And I first thought to myself, I must be hallucinating something. Hallucinating something there. And then I realized I was not. That was really a rattlesnake. And it was about six feet long. It was a really big one. The road was probably ten feet wide. So I came in up on it in the left side. And in my previous encounters, the snakes always just cross, cross the road or cross the trail and they get on their way but I think this snake was spooked by my lights it just sat there didn't move a bit and I waited for several minutes I kept thinking back to my snake training where this uh, I've been to seminars and where I live because we have snakes here too and the snake trainers always said you know if the rattlesnake is not coiled up it's probably not going to uh, be aggressive and it, it can't it can't strike at you um, usually they can only strike about half the length of their body but having said that I knew I was safe but that was in theory this was the real thing and I was thinking to myself I was tired am I really gonna walk in front of this rattlesnake because I had I went there's no way else to go I couldn't turn around and go back the other way so I waited there a few minutes and then another runner came up on me which was also experienced, and he said, he's not gonna bother us, let's just give him room and pass him. And sure enough, that's what happened. So um, I've had several encounters like that and uh, kind of come, come to peace with the snakes, but the best thing to do if you encounter one is to, is to back up, give the snake a lot of space, and uh, be on your way. If he's crossing a, a, um, a single track or a road, let him, let him pass. And you definitely never want to throw something at them or startle them. If they're, if they're there and they're not moving, they're not going to bother you. Just try to get by them. Um, other snakes like copperheads, you got to be a little more careful. Um, up where my family, some of my family lives in Arkansas, they have a lot of copperheads. Copperheads, um, <clears throat> they blend in very well. They're hard to see in leaves. And they will charge you if you make them very angry. It's one of the few snakes that I know that will do that. <clears throat> Coral snakes. Coral snakes are a real small snake, uh, poisonous snake, but I saw one um, at the Huntsville 100 uh, miler, and uh, it was just laying in the trail. It looked like it was dead. We came back around on the next loop and it was gone. They have real small fangs. It's really difficult to get bitten by a coral snake. You never, you know, with a coral snake or any snake, you never want to pick them up. And um, some other snakes that you'll see out there, uh, it's like striped gardener snakes, uh, striped snakes, uh, rat snakes. They're usually very close to water, and they're harmless. They're beautiful snakes. Just let them, they will try to strike you if you anger them, but um, they can't hurt you. You just let them go by. Water moccasins, water, water moccasins you got to be real careful about. I've never seen one on the trails. One thing to keep in mind with about water moccasins is there are more water moccasins outside of water than inside of water. They're usually not in the water. They go in there to at times, but usually they're in the area around the water, so you gotta be careful. Um, what else about snakes? Um, you know, but this, I think snake, this snake advice is really mid-pack to back of the pack advice. Um, you know, front runners don't tend to see snakes too much because they're running during the day. But yeah, you know, they're, they're part of nature and you gotta be on alert. Um, you never know when you might see one. If you do get bit by one, the best thing to do is just uh, be calm. Don't put a tourniquet on yourself. Don't try to suck out the poison. Um, just try to get to help as soon as you can. And if, if other people are running with you, send one person to get help and 
one person to stay with you. And the same thing is if you come up on a runner that's hurt or been bitten by a snake in a race, definitely want to stay with them and send somebody for help. Other things uh, that I'd like to talk about is J&J &J 100K. I've got that, that race. Uh, I'm recording this on Thursday. I, my race is tomorrow on Friday. Um, it's a 100-kilometer race. Um, they also have a 25, a, actually a 10, a 25K, and a 50K race, 50-mile race. The 100K race is a USATF uh, trail championships for the USA. Has a two thousand dollar prize purse. Um, I don't have a USATF card. I'm just running it for fun. But there will be a lot of pros out there running it. Um, this race, <clears throat> this race is held out at Camp Eagle. Uh, you may have heard that name before because Camp Eagle is where Bandera One Hundred was earlier this year. Bandera One Hundred is usually in Bandera, Texas, at the state park there. But this year it got rained out. And they had to move it to Camp Eagle. Camp Eagle is in Rock Springs, Texas. It's about uh, an hour from Kerrville or about two and a half hours from San Antonio. Um, it's a very rocky area. The name does it justice. Um, very technical. A lot of hills. Not mountains, but a lot of hills. And uh, I, even, I saw a lot of race reports from Bandera. Even the pros were saying it was very difficult. And it's going to be a hot race. When I ran Bandera earlier this year, it was in January, so it was it was cooler, and uh, the race starts in the morning and you finish you know late at night. Well, it's a little bit different. Uh, for J and J, we're actually starting at 7 p.m. on Friday night, and so I plan to be finishing late afternoon on Saturday. So, but the, I'm, I'm I know the trails. Um, they they said they've changed the course a little bit but I know most of the trails I know what to expect and uh, it's one of those races after I did it last time I told myself I would never do that that particular course again but you know us ultra runners we got a little bit we got a little bit of a crazy gene um, sure enough I signed up for it again um, it's just convenient I, I like the the group Teos trails that puts on the race they do a good job it's a three lap course it's got several many aid stations they do a real good job so I'm looking forward to that. Some some highlights from when I ran it earlier this year. Some one area that really I thought was challenging was after dark. You're running along a river section and it gets very uh, foggy. So it made it a little bit challenging to um, follow follow my way with the lights. You know, you're looking for snakes and single track, you know, near the water, you got to be careful of snakes. And, I, you know, it's, you know, basically you're walking through fog on the side of a riverbank, kind of a rocky riverbank. And uh, there were a couple uh, sections where um, I didn't see anybody for a long time. And, you know, you hear the occasional animal noises. And I remember at one point during the, the race earlier this year, I heard some animal noises that I was not familiar with. It wasn't a coyote. It wasn't a mountain lion. I don't know what it was, but it kind of spooked me. But um, I typically use my poles in the in the race, and uh, it's interesting. My poles uh, kind of give me some, uh, in my mind, extra protection. <laughs> it's funny how that works. But I've got the race tomorrow, and then um, I've got about four weeks until the Havilena 100. That's going to be 100 miles. So like I said earlier in the podcast, I... I ran basically 82 miles last year. I finished the 100K and made it part of the way. And then I ran and had some lower back problems. I feel like my fitness is better. And I've been working on my core strength. I think I understand how to handle my salt level better. Just overall, overall I think I'm a better ultra runner compared to last year. Um, nice thing is my brother is going out there as well. He's going to run the 100K. So this time I'm not completely alone out in uh, Phoenix. So it should be good fun. I, I think I'm well prepared for it and I look forward to it. It's a great event, one of the biggest ultras in uh, the United States. And uh, Ari, Arivapa Racing, I butcher their name, they do a really good job of uh, putting on events and this is their, uh, uh, basically their uh, top event that they put on every year.
Okay, uh, now we have the Garmin Phoenix 6X product review. Um, the Phoenix 6X is a GPS watch. It, it's considered one of the, the best uh, running watches out there on the market. Um, I've been using the, the Phoenix 5X for two years, and about two weeks ago, I got the 6X. I upgraded. So I have a lot of experience with the Garmin Phoenix series been very happy with them and uh, in this episode I'm going to go over some of the differences, some of the improvements, some of the things I think they should should improve on, etc. Um, some of their competition out there is uh, Sunto and uh, Koros. Um, they also make good watches. Sunto, um, I know a little bit more about Koros. I see a lot of people as ambassadors for them, they're kind of a lower cost watch out on the market. Sunto is very comparable in pricing to uh, the Garmin watches. The thing I think the big advantage Garmin has over Sunto is the back end, the software on your phone and computer. I believe is much better than uh, than uh, Sunto, and I've seen a lot of feedback uh, um, to uh, back that up. Anyways, let's talk about Garmin. That's what I'm most familiar with, and this is a product review for the Phoenix 6X. I'm comparing it to the 5X series. So the 5X was in the $600 range, $600 and change, and uh, the new uh, 6X model is in the $750 range. They have a new solar version, which isn't over $1,000, it's around $1,100 has a solar chip in it so that it recharges the watch. Um, the, the, power, the power capabilities of this new model is so good that, I, in my personal opinion, the solar is not needed. But So I'm not going to talk too much about the solar. It's a pretty big price jump. Well, let's get started. Uh, display size on the 5X was about 1.2 inches, about 30.4 millimeters. The the six X is about two millimeters, uh, I'm sorry, uh, five millimeters uh, larger. It's about a quarter inch larger, and I I see a noticeably uh, noticeable uh, difference uh, when I'm wearing it. Um, another reason for that is uh, when we're talking about display, not only is it a little bit bigger, um, the screen resolution went from two forty by two forty to two eighty by two eighty, and it's really beautiful. It's really uh, crisp and detailed. Uh, I didn't have any complaints about the previous model, but you, I can I can tell that there's a, bit, a big improvement in uh, the uh, the visual uh, aspects of the watch. I really like it a lot. The mechanics are very similar. Uh, they're either stainless and titanium. They have a, a few different models. They both, the previous and the new model, use the sapphire glass, which is very good. You know, I had my 5X, used it for two years. I also used it in my daily, as my daily watch, and I would hit it up against doorknobs, and, you know, how many times I fell on my face, scraping through rocks. You know, trail running in Texas, we kind of call rock gardens. Uh, most of the trail races are very technical, a lot of rocks. I really hit my watch on a lot of rocks all the time, and in my 5X, after two years, it doesn't doesn't have any scratches on it, on the face. So I, I really think the quality of the sapphire glass is very good, and and I can understand why they carried that on into the new model. Um, it has Bluetooth and uh, Wi-Fi built in. You can also store music in the new 6X, um, which you could not do on the previous 5X unless you had the 5X Plus. Um, it can hold up to 2,000 songs. Um, another uh, big uh, add-on to the new 6X, it has Pacer Pro to help you adjust your pace, which I have found uh, very useful. It will beep and t you can set it many different settings to, uh, to help you keep within your pace or your heartbeat. Um, the top, I'm using a data screen, uh, one, or, or watch face, I must, I might say, that has the, the, the red and green and yellow uh, fields on the top of my watch. I can see them very easy when I'm running, and uh, I know that if um, I like my settings, 
if I get above uh, 152 on my heartbeat, it, it gets in the red zone. But I don't necessarily have to look at the numbers. I can look at the colors. It's very useful, especially in bright sunlight. <coughs> and uh, the amount of data uh, put on, on, the, on the watch face is, is been, has been uh, increased almost 2x. Um, I've got five different data fields on my um, on my watch now. There were the previous uh, 5x and 5x plus had that capability, but you had to import watch faces from third parties on the Garmin website, <clears throat> which I didn't think was very um, um, easy to do. Especially if you're like me, I'm not the I'm very good with computers, but I'm not a real big techie where you know importing watch faces from third parties and stuff like that. I don't like to do that. I like the, the capability to exist on the watch already. Uh, another another big add-on for the 6X is the, like I said, the widget display. It looks much better and also the way the widgets are embedded in the software. On the 5X, um, you you had to scroll through lots of different widgets. You know, the the Garmin Phoenix series is series can be used for so many different sports, you know, swimming, trail running, hiking, even golf. There's about 20 different widgets on there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I would have to scroll through the different uh, widgets, put them in order. Um the watch came that way. But now in the 6X they they've made a big improvement. So all of those different widgets are in the watch, but in order to start using them, you need to import it. So, for example, for me, I've only imported the widget for running, trail running, and cycling. And um, yeah, if I use do another sport, I can import that. But it's real easy to find it now. So I think they, they, they did a, a big improvement in how they, they adjust the widgets in the software. Um, sensors, most of the sensors are the same. They, the, they did... Um, uh, add where you can it has a, a sleep sensor what they call spo2 so it can monitor your sleep when you're sleeping and uh, i think also they improved the vo2 capabilities it does give you a vo2 reading um, the the watch just does uh, so much you know the previous one did uh, this one is really they really beefed it up um, the memory they've they've doubled in the 5x series. Um, you had 16 gigabytes of storage. Now you have 32 gigabytes. This is the this is the real plus. This is where I want to spend some time. You know, previously, I'll be honest on my 5x. If I was running an ultra, you know, the on the ultra mode, it was rated for 24, 25 hours. But <clears throat> I would turn off my heart rate monitor. Uh, heart sensor just so I can make sure that I had enough power to go through the whole ultra um, now when you turn on your watch it says it's got 21 days worth of power it's really unbelievable the improvement they've done in the battery um, what that means is you have 60 hours in normal mode that's more than double what it used to do in ultra track and the 5x and uh, in ultra track mode you have 120 hours so it, this watch now is set up with battery life where you can run all your sensors and you can use it for a 100 miler, no problem. And uh, it's really a big improvement. Just that change alone is worth buying the watch in my opinion. And that's the reason that um, I'm using the, the 6X. Um, my brother and I uh, got both got the watch. It has a new mode called jacket mode so that if you're skiing or you you're wearing a jacket. You can also uh, wear the watch on outside of the jacket. That's, I guess it, it's set up so that it's, it's more sensitive, uh, so they can get the same readings. A 66 hour mo uh, uh, battery capability in jacket mode. And then they even got a new one called expedition mode where let's say you're dog sledding or you're on a multi-day event. Um, the watch can go 27 days on expedition mode. And that's, it will ping the GPS once per day. So it's very adjustable. And like I said before, it can uh, hold 2,000 songs or podcasts. Um, the only limitation there is, um, which I, I think 
is is a room for improvement in the future is you need to have a pair of headphones the the watch doesn't have a speaker so you you can't i like to run without my phone unless i'm in an ultra i don't carry my phone um and uh for me having music on my watch doesn't help me too much if uh if i have to have headphones too because uh in my experience headphones wear out real fast I don't know if my sweat is just very corrosive or what, but I typically don't use headphones. I use, I have a little JP, JBL hang, hanging speaker that will last me 8 to 10 hours. I usually hang it on my pack or carry it in my hand, but I don't like to use headphones. <clears throat> so keep in mind that these watches, they do hold songs, but the, the watches, the previous, the 5X, the 5X Plus and also the 6X uh, doesn't have a speaker on it, so you need to have headphones. And it communicates via Bluetooth. Um, the watch size, the watch is a little bit bigger. Uh, like I said, the screen, um, the case size is actually the same at 51 meters, 51 millimeters, but the overall watch is uh, thinner. It's at 14.7 millimeters, whereas the 5X series is at 15.8. To me, the watch, the watch looks bigger, the screen's bigger, but it feels about it feels about the same as the previous watch, but actually it's uh, it's a little bit thinner, so um, it, it it is a little bit lighter. Um, water resistant, down to ten atm. Uh, you know, basically you can swim with the watch, which is equivalent to a hundred meters. I don't I don't think most people are ever going to go more than a few meters uh, deep swimming, but if you're a triathlete, you could actually use both the the five series and the six series. Uh, I've done that all the time. I swim with uh, swimming, and I'll swim with my kids. And chlorinated water doesn't hurt it hurt the watches at all. Um, the band, they have made some improvement on the band. Um, if you're like me, when you when you wear <clears throat> your watch during the day, you like it to be a little bit loose. Um, when I'm running, and I like it to be a little bit tighter. I don't like it to, you know, jog side to side. You know, I you know chafe my skin doing that for 20 hours so I I have basically two settings for my watch band and uh, the good news is that the new band is uh, it's a lot it's a lot more finer pitched so there you can get a more accurate setting when you want the tightness you know sometimes you're maybe the thickness of your wrist is in between the you know, in between the band holes and, you know, when you go to tighter, it's a little bit tighter than you want. This one's a little bit more finer pitch, so you can get a better adjustment. That's the good news. The bad news is, and I think is uh, maybe maybe it gets better over time. I've had to watch a month, but it is harder uh, to put on and off. You know, you have to spend a little bit more time, and that's because the, the finer pitch. Um, you know, you got two... Um, two bands that the tongue needs to go through and uh, get it so getting it on and off it takes a little bit more time but I think it's I think it's worth it and uh, my road ID I know a lot of runners triathletes use road ID you know basically it's a little metal tag that you put on your watch that has your personal information for me I have uh, like five family members phone numbers my name and also my passport number I got my passport number on there because I'm I'm often in China for work and I run over there as well, so if I go down, it's real easy for people to find out who I am and who to call. Well, this road this road ID um, tag, um, the size the size um, for the five X fits for the six X, so I didn't have to buy a new one. So I just basically transferred it to my new watch. So I'm very happy about that. Um, like I said, the watches are. Is a little, the 6X is a little bit thinner, so um, the details on that is the previous, the 5 Series was 3.4 ounces or 96 grams. The new watch 6X is 2.89 2.89 ounces or 82 grams. You're getting a lot, what looks like a bigger watch with a, a lot, more than double the battery capabilities, and it's lighter. Oh, what a steal. So um, I've been real happy with it so far. And uh, I'm not sponsored by Garmin. I'm just a big fan. I guess I'm a fanboy of Garmin. Um, I've used them for many years, back even when they had the really big watches. And uh, used the 5X for two years. And uh, now I'm, I'm using the 6X. I've had it two or three weeks, and I'm very happy with it. 
So I highly recommend it. Um, the, like I said, the other the other competitors out there, Sunto and and uh, Coros, you can check them out if you're looking for a new watch. But I definitely recommend going for the high end watches. You know, the four to seven hundred dollar range. Uh, Garmin and the other brands buy uh, much simpler watches, but the battery life is not good as good as if you're going to be running ultras. You need one that's going to last a long time, especially if you're in the mid and back of the pack like myself. Um, give you example. Before I had this, um, I was using the iPhone. Uh, I mean the iWatch uh, Nike version. You use the GPS for three or four hours, it's dead. And I know they've improved it a little bit on the latest version, but. If you're gonna if you're gonna run distances longer than a marathon, you really need to have a high end uh, Garmin or Sunto watch or maybe Coros. I, I'm not I'm not familiar with them so much, but um, battery life is real important. There's nothing worse than you know running seventy five percent of your ultra and then your your watch dies, and then when you try to sync it with Strava, you don't have the full record there. It's a real disappointment. Um, the batteries. And these new watches are so good that um, you'll have no problem with uh, battery life. You just need to keep it charged. And uh, that's about it. I highly recommend the Garmin watches. I I'm a, consider myself somewhat of an expert on them. And if you have any questions on, on uh, either model, the 5 Series or the 6 Series, uh, send me an email. Um, and I'd be happy to uh, answer your questions. Um, looking at my list of negatives so no speaker I think that's something they can improve in the future I have had some sync issues I think um, maybe their software for the new 6x needs to, a few more updates I've had a few cases where I had to turn off my iPhone and turn it back on before it would sync but it hasn't been too often um, I think it's the new I think it's a software issue it's not a hardware issue um, and like I said the band fit is better but it's hard to get on and off you know, something that I think might improve as it wear gets a little bit more wear. Um, but um, that's it for my uh, product review. I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to uh, my fifth podcast. Uh, if you'd like to follow me on social media, I can be fo found on Instagram at runner r w e, uh, Twitter at runner r w e. And at Strava on Strava, I'm Richard Runner RWE, and I also have the Mile Sixty Two Club on Strava. Uh, we post some local runs in the Texas area, and then when we go, when I go to uh, runs outside of Texas, such as Haveline Hundred, we'll post uh, get-togethers where you know we can meet. We can meet uh, new. Everybody can meet new uh, new friends in the ultra running community. But I, I try to keep that updated. And also, if you have any feedback or questions about the podcast, um, I would love to get your emails. My email address is runnerrwe at gmail.com. Um, also, if you would, please uh, give me a review on my podcast on iTunes. And please uh, subscribe. It's free. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoy my podcast. Uh, my focus really is on the mid to back of the pack. And... Uh, you know, sharing product reviews, race reports, and uh, <clears throat> I'm I'm happy to uh, discuss subjects that you may email me about on future podcasts. Uh, thank you, and have fun running out there. Bye bye.